You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, Episode 95, David Burnett, The Resurrection and the Death of the Gods. I'm your layman. Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you? Very good. We're we're real happy to have David Burnett back. Dave, how are you doing? Good. How are you guys? Yeah, very good. Good to hear your voice, and uh, thanks for taking the time to do this again with us. My Trey, you were, yeah, you were we'll going to say something? Well, by the name of the title, Resurrection and the Death of the Gods, I'm, I'm excited about this episode. So Yeah, yeah, it's a good title. I can hardly wait to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to see the gods get what they deserve, you know? <laughs> Hey, Dave, why don't you, uh, for, for those who may not have heard you before, David has been on um, the podcast before, and he pastors a church in Arthur City, Texas. So, Dave, if you could give listeners a bit of an update, you know, since you were on the last time, you know, what's what's been going on with the church, with you? I mean, how, how are things? Yeah, uh, things are pretty good. The The church is going pretty well. We've uh, been we've taken a break from Genesis and been going through some different uh, passages, and I think things are going well there. And uh, I've been continuing my research, and just recently uh, presented a paper two weeks ago at the Southwest Commission on Religious Studies, which is the regional meeting for the Society of Biblical Literature and the American Academy of Religion. And uh, I presented a paper there called a neglected Deuteronomic scriptural matrix for the nature of the resurrection body in 1 Corinthians 15, 39 through 42. So this is an atrociously long title, I recognize. So, um, But the, the simple version is, is I'm challenging um, kind of the consensus and scholarship of what the background is um, to this list of creatures that Paul brings up in 1 Corinthians 15 in his conversation about the nature of the resurrection body. So and you're, so, you're going to give us, this is going to be the gist of what you're going to give us in this episode in, in uh, non academies Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll boil it down and make it uh, hopefully easy to understand. Yeah. Well, scholars like those, those long highfalutin titles, you know, we used to, I don't know if you remember this, but we used to give these little uh, awards, you know, I had a small group of friends every year at ETS, you know, we'd give these uh, invisible kind of after the evening uh, or after the day's events awards at ETS for who had the most obtuse paper title, you know, who had the funniest paper title. So your your paper title would, uh, you'd probably get one for obtuse. You'd you'd get a nomination for that. (laughs) Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, we like we like those long, hard to figure out titles. So, well, I'm glad you're, uh, you know, you're doing well. Now, you you've gotten a paper accepted for the national. Is it is it this one or is it a different one? Yeah, it's this one. Okay, yeah, so this... national meeting in November mm-hmm, in San Antonio. So I'll actually be. Um, this one's going to be very interesting. Um, I'm actually participating in a uh, seminar. Um, for first in First Corinthians fifteen, entitled uh, "Death, Resurrection, and Transformation in Scripture" in One Corinthians fifteen, and so it's a uh, I think Roy Champa, um, Craig Keener, Linda Belleville, um, Raymond Collins, uh, some other David Litva, who we've spoke mm, about before, sure. we're mm-hmm. all in this seminar together. So it's going to be it's going to it's going to be really great. Uh, I'm going to submit the paper ahead of time, and there'll be formal responses to the paper and open dialogue. So it'll be very similar to what I did in 2014 at SBL, uh, but this one is a little bit, I think, a little bit more formalized. Um, it's a part of a two part seminar on First Corinthians 15, so we're the second part. So I'm really excited to be um, involved in that, and so the paper that I'll I'll be presenting there is kind of an advanced version of the one I did just a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still doing some more research on that. And hopefully sometimes these seminars turn into edited books. I'm hoping that happens. Um, Mm -hmm. If not, I'll submit it to a journal. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. And for those again, who are listening the I bring up the, the annual meetings with, with a good bit of frequency here. I mean that this, this next one David's talking about is in San Antonio. 
So it's always the week before Thanksgiving. And if anybody who, you know, anybody lives in the area, I mean, Trey is actually planning on uh, making the trip. We're planning on uh, doing something related to the, to the podcast uh, in San Antonio next year. But anybody who lives in the neighborhood and wants to check out, hey, what happens at these meetings? You know, I, I, I offered this at, at uh, Atlanta last November and had a few people come. You know, we just sort of, you know, walk around and go to papers and, hey, this is what scholars do. And they get a chance to listen to some people, names that they know, a lot of names that they don't know. But, you know, if you're in the area, I'll be putting more information about it uh, on the on the blog, you know, as the time approaches, you know, toward November. And David, so David, I'll, David, I'll be ahead. your plant. So if you have any questions <laughs> you want me to ask you, I'll make you look good. If you just want to give me your questions beforehand, I'll, I'll, no. I'll make you look yeah. good. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that, but I try to keep it as honest as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's no fun. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Uh, well, you know, somebody has to be boring, I guess. You know, just uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. Hey, why don't you uh, jump in now? We can just get started and you jump in where you want to jump in. And Trey and I will, uh, with everybody else, we'll listen and you know have a conversation where we need to. And the rest of the time is essentially yours. All right. Well, um, like I said, the premise of my paper is um, 1 Corinthians 15 is, as we all know, kind of the central text for resurrection, not just in Paul, but in the New Testament, really. I mean, it's the only very clear, um, well, relatively clear passage we have on, that actually goes into detail, not only of kind of the narrative of what happens in resurrection, but goes even into the nature of the resurrection body itself. And so this, uh, that's extremely significant in 1 Corinthians 15, because it's, al- it's often used in kind of apologetic conversations about um, the proof of the resurrection and look at all the witnesses and this kind of thing. But that's not really what I'm tackling here. What I'm tackling here is the conversation that Paul has Um, on the actual nature of the resurrection body. And um, the passage is coming from uh, verse 35 through 42 in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, And I'll just just read that passage. And actually, um, I probably want to read down to verse 50 because it's all um, one solid unit here. So um, I'll read it in English, and uh, we'll we'll get into it. It's, uh, Paul says, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he is chosen, and each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there, are, there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the earthly another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born uh, the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So that's the passage. It's a pretty long passage, but, um, and it focuses on this metaphor for the resurrection of the sowing of the seed. 
and the seed going into the ground and coming up different, the old body versus the new body in the resurrection. And right in the center of that conversation, we have this interesting list of creatures, this comparison between earthly bodies like terrestrial bodies uh, um, that are on the earth and then celestial bodies. And Paul uses language of flesh to describe the first group. And then he uses the language of glory to describe the second group. And the traditional background for this list, um, since obviously he's pawing, uh, Paul's drawing on Adam language there, um, traditionally all scholars have said, oh, well, this is clearly Genesis 1 and 2 language. You know, you have the created um, animals and you have the sun, moon, stars, and then you have a mention of Adam. And there's even the mention of seed and their types in the creation story in Genesis 1. So clearly this, this is drawing on Genesis 1 and 2 for sure. And so that's the consensus of the background of this creature list here in 1 Corinthians 15, 39 through 42. But there are some problems with this view. The actual list of the creatures, if Paul is drawing on Genesis 1, 11 through 28, which is the traditional background that's listed for this, um, they don't actually follow the same order. They're in reverse. It's backwards. And not only do they not follow the same order, but it actually doesn't follow the same pattern of naming the creatures either. So there's this assumed consensus in the secondary literature that doesn't see any need for any alternate model. And so they're overlooking a possible background that could actually provide a more robust reading of the passage in its wider literary and narrative context. And so when you actually see the list of creatures here, Paul starts with, um, in verse 39, with with the flesh, um, those are of flesh. And he says, man, domestic animals, birds, and fish. Now, this is the backwards order from Genesis 1, and there's verses in between them. But there is a list that follows the same order. And it's not in Genesis 1. It's actually found in Deuteronomy 4. Because Paul goes through, says, man, animals, birds, and fish. And then he goes, when he gets to the celestial bodies because there's he separates them the earthly from the celestial and he says sun moon stars there is actually an order that there's actually a text that follows that same order deuteronomy 4 mm-hmm. and so in deuteronomy 4 um deuteronomy 4 uh specifically the passage i'm drawing on is verse 15 through 19 and uh this text or 15 through 20 actually and in this text um this is yeah. the just this is for, a, for those yeah. for those who who don't recall maybe this is a divine counsel passage you know Deuteronomy 32 worldview and this is the Deuteronomy right. 4 passage for it yeah so what i meant in the, this um longer title Deuteronomic scriptural matrix all i mean is there's a con, there's a group of texts throughout Deuteronomy that all refer to these um celestial powers mm-hmm. as the gods or angels of nations and Deuteronomy 4 is one of these passages and mm-hmm. Deuteronomy 4 is actually incredibly important because it's talking about the context is um not to not to make any graven images. So this is an aniconic passage. This is a passage about idolatry and not worshiping the powers of the gods. And it actually narrates, uh, it has this list of creatures and then gives the reason for it because Israel was exodus. They were elected and chosen from out the nations and they're not given to these powers. So I want to read this text because it's very surprising for, uh, for many who haven't considered it as a background for 1 Corinthians 15, but it actually follows the same list of creatures. I'll read it. It says, Closely guard your souls because you did not see a likeness on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb in the mountain from the midst of the fire. Do not act lawlessly and make for yourselves a carved likeness of any image, a likeness of male or female, a likeness of any animal that's on the earth, a likeness of any winged bird that flies under the heaven, a likeness of any reptile that creeps on the ground, and a likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. So here we see th- there's the same list in the same order um, of creatures in the earthly as Paul lists here. Now, there is the reptile included in Deuteronomy 4 passage, but that Paul does not include. And so someone might say, well, yeah, reptiles in that list. It's not in Paul's. But reptiles are in the list in Genesis 1 as well. So <laughs> that's not, um, that's not a ca- category yeah, to dismiss this. Yeah, it's not an impediment either way. 
Right. Either way, they're, they're, these reptiles are listed in Genesis 1 and in the Deuteronomy 4 passage. But Paul lists them in the same order. And, and Deuteronomy also has this division between the earthly creatures and the celestial. Because right after he lists those creatures, Deuteronomy says, And do not lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the, and the author of Deuteronomy calls them all the hosts of heaven. And be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the nations under the whole heaven. But God has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to become for him an allotted people, as in this day. So what's, this is very interesting, the conglomeration of language here in Deuteronomy 4, the language that's used in this list. Because the premise to not make any graven images of any of these creatures, um, the fleshly creatures, was mm-hmm. you didn't see his likeness. And it's the, the, the Greek term here is omioma. Now, Paul uses this term elsewhere. Paul uses this term of Christ when he takes on the likeness of sinful flesh. That, so so the, the, the body itself is referred to in this language. So the likeness is of these fleshly creatures. So when Paul's listing the differentiation of these bodies, the earthly and the celestial, it follows that not only the same pattern of Deuteronomy 4, but this second group in Deuteronomy 4, the sun, moon, stars, are called the host of heaven that were allotted to all the nations. And so this is part of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Elsewhere, you know, in Deuteronomy 17, Three, you have the language to come back up of this um, other gods language where it says, if there is found in your midst any of your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you, a man or woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God by transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them, whether the sun, the moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have forbidden. So in Deuteronomy 17, you already have this, this type of language again, repeating the same type of language from Deuteronomy 4, sun, moon, and host of heaven is kind of just a secondary for sun, moon, and stars. And they're called the other gods. And so hmm. later in Deuteronomy 29, you, the language pops back up of allotment mm-hmm. in twenty nine twenty six, And they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they had not known, whom he had not allotted to them. So again, we're drawing on that allotted language from four, and of course it climaxes in the Song of Moses and mm-hmm. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 that your listeners are well aware of with the allotment of the sons of God or angels of God over the nations. Um, so what we're having here is if this list is the list that Paul's drawing on, why is he drawing on this list mm-hmm. um, instead of Genesis? Because this passage, we might forget what it's actually about. Resurrection isn't just about, hey, there's a miracle, you get to live eternally and get back up out of the grave. Mm-hmm. It's an actual change of nature here. And that th- these celestial bodies are not just kind of inanimate objects for Paul that he's listing. In the Jewish cosmology, in the Jewish view of the cosmic order, these creatures uh, are these these are actual creatures. These are beings. And not, not just beings or creatures, but specifically that language of sun, moon, stars is used for the gods of the nations, for the ones who would rule over the ethne or the nations. You know, you know what's really interesting? I mean, while, while you were going through that, I ran a, a quick search here on the, uh, for the herpetu, you know, the, the quote-unquote reptile or other translations would just have quadruped. You think, the thing that's omitted. And mm-hmm. one of the references is Romans one, and it has the other the other elements there: man, birds, animals. You know, yep. with them, and that's clearly idolatry. You know, clearly, it's it's actually in the verse that talks about exchanging you know the 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 worship of the creator for the created thing. You know, making themselves images and so on and so forth. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's a pretty clear. The idolatry is a pretty clear element here. Yeah, and it's amazing because uh, why. Why scholars wouldn't recognize this list it is kind of boggling my mind because Paul in <laughs> 1 Corinthians has already drawn on this list. He's already drawn on the Deuteronomy language mm-hmm. um, in late, earlier in 1 Corinthians because yeah, – Chapter 10. 
Yeah, and and eight through twelve is dealing with the idolatry issues, mm-hmm. and there even he even quotes from Deuteronomy four. Um, for example, in the 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 famous Christology uh, passage um, in one Corinthians eight five and six, when he says, "Therefore, as to eating food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. That is, there is no God but one." Which is coming from Deuteronomy four thirty five and thirty nine. And he mm-hmm. says, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven and earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, and, the, and one Lord. You know the passage. So mm-hmm. what, what's interesting there is that's the passage of election from Deuteronomy. That for us, you know, we've been exodus out. We've been drawn out of Egypt, which has their own gods allotted to them. Mm-hmm. And we have one Father, one God. It's Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so the same kind of complex of language he's already drawing on in 1 Corinthians um, and continues to draw on it. And it, it's, it's very interesting. But back to the, um, the Deuteronomy 4 um, passage, Paul wouldn't be the only one in Second Temple Judaism at, at his actual time mm-hmm. to use Deuteronomy 4 this way, to talk about these celestial bodies as actual rulers over the cosmos. Matter of fact, and we've talked about this before, Mike, but Philo actually uses this same exact Deuteronomy 4 passage when he's describing the Jewish view of the cosmos. When he describes the Jewish view of the cosmos and how the cosmos is ordered and set up, the passages from Special Laws 1, 13, and 19. I'm going to read that to you because this is fascinating. And some people just have never made these connections. So the passage reads like this. Philo says, Some have supposed that the sun and moon and other stars were gods with absolute powers. And the term here is autokratoras, meaning they're just, they have powers in and of themselves, you know, mm-hmm. and, and ascribe to them the causation of all events. But Moses held that the cosmos, this is the term in Greek for world that Paul uses all the time, um, the cosmos was created and is in the sense the greatest of commonwealths, having rulers. And now his term for rulers here is archontas and excusa. This is the term that Paul uses, the, the terms that Paul uses for the powers and the principalities. Yeah. Same terms. So uh, Philo's talking about the cosmos as this great government saying it has rulers, these rulers, and it has subjects. Now for the rulers, the archontas, all the celestial bodies, the oranupantas, the, all the celestial bodies, he says, fixed or wandering. For subjects, such beings as exist below the moon, in the air or on the earth. So you see the separation here, just like Deuteronomy 4 sets out. Right, you you have the celestial bodies that rule everything um, under the moon, which is air on the earth. So we got birds, right. and all the creatures uh, under the dome, and all that kind of stuff. It's right. still part of the world as we know it. Uh huh. Now as, he as goes the, on. We'd experience it. Yeah, he goes on and says the said rulers, however, in his view, have not unconditional powers, but they are rulers or lieutenants of the one Father of all, and it's by copying the example of his government exercised according to justice and law, deking, so this is used for righteousness all the time in the Mm -hmm. New Testament, over all created beings, that they acquit themselves aright. But to those who do not describe the charioteer mounted above, attribute the causation of all events in the cosmos to the team that draw the chariot, as though they were the sole agents. So he's he's picking on the Greeks here, (laughs) you know? He's like, look, these dumb Greeks... They're they're attributing all the works of the creation to these little secondary rulers, the ones who actually draw the chariot of the big yeah. boss guy on the chariot. Yeah, so he's, he's they're worshiping the flunkies. Yeah, yeah, they're making he's making fun of them. He goes on to say, from this ignorance. Now this is where it gets interesting. Look at the passage he quotes here. He says, from this <laughs> ignorance, our most holy lawgiver would convert them to knowledge with these words. Quote. Do not, when thou seest the sun, moon, and stars, and all the hosts of heaven, go astray and worship them. Deuteronomy 4.19. Yep, yep. Quotes the same passage. And he says, well, indeedly and aptly does he call the acceptance of the heavenly bodies as gods going astray and wandering. And then later he says, 
the other stars in accordance with their sympathetic affinity to things on earth, acting and working in a thousand ways to preserve uh, the all, have wandered infinitely far in supposing that they alone are gods. So all the gods, which since descries in heaven, must not suppose to possess absolute power but to have received the rank of subordinate rulers, naturally liable to correction, though in virtue of their excellence, never destined to undergo it. So isn't, in Philo's mind... Yeah, yeah, isn't that ahead. really interesting, you know, how, how Philo, a Jew, would use Deuteronomy 4 essentially for evangelism? You know, that, that you guys need to quit, you know, worshiping the lesser ones and turn your attention to the, to the real, you know, to, to the true God, the one that actually does run everything. You know, it's just kind of interesting. Yeah, so well that's that's a very good point because what's going on here is he so he himself is a Jew. So in his mind he's one of these chosen people mm-hmm. and so he's not under those powers. But in his mind all the other nations are. Because mm-hmm. and so and he's and he even calls them the celestial bodies themselves are the archontas and the excuse of the rulers and principalities. Now th- this is the exact same language Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15. He calls them the celestial bodies, same terms that Philo's using, and he even calls them earlier in 1 Corinthians the rulers, principalities, and powers. We're going to come back to that, but there's something about Philo here that's very interesting. In this passage, he thinks that these powers are fine. He's like, all the gods that describes in heaven, they're not, they don't possess absolute powers, but they're subordinate rulers, and they're, they are naturally liable to correction, but though in virtue of their excellence, they're never destined to undergo it. So he's not an apocalypticist. Mm-hmm. Philo, Philo doesn't think there's anything wrong with these gods per se. He just thinks Greeks are stupid to worship them. He's like, you should worship the one father of all, you know. Why are you attributing all things to these secondary powers? He doesn't really have a problem with them, though, as much. Now, Philo is very platonic, though. He's very platonic. He's very involved in uh, platonic readings of the Old Testament. He has all kinds of allegory that he uses, uh, platonic philosophy, um, to, to describe Old Testament texts. And Plato commonly has this, that shares the same kind of a view that you have powers that are um, ruling over uh, humans because they can't take care of themselves. So <laughs> a passage uh, that talks about this in Plato is in Plato's Laws, in uh in four seven thirteen and, and in seven thirty eight um there's this conversation um that goes on in Plato's laws and and the Athenian says this when they're describing kind of the order of the cosmic government. He says, Well then, tradition tells us how blissful was the life of men in that age, furnished with everything in abundance and of spontaneous growth, and the cause thereof is said to have been this. Well, so why is everything working so great? Why is everything in like this beautiful cosmic order? He gives you the reason. He says, Kronos, you know, their high god of time, he says he was aware of the fact that no human being, as we have explained, is capable of having irresponsible control of all human affairs without becoming filled with pride and injustice. So pondering this fact, he then appointed as kings and rulers for our cities, not men, but beings of a race that was nobler and more divine, namely demons. He acted, as we now do in the case of sheep and herds of tame animals. We do not set oxen as rulers over oxen or goats over goats, but we who are of a nobler race ourselves rule over them. In like manner, the God in his love for humanity set over us at that time the nobler race of demons, who with much comfort to themselves and much to us took charge of us and furnished peace for us and modesty and orderliness and justice without stint and thus made the tribes of men free from feud and happy. <laughs> so now, this, it, what, what, this is which, in Plato. Yeah, which, which book was, was that in Plato? This is in Plato's Laws. Okay, get, well, catch this. Is the, it, this is really interesting. Not, not long ago, uh, you don't know him, but uh, the audience will. Doug Van Dorn sent me an email with a, a passage in Plato about this, about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And th- this is at the end of his critics. And mm-hmm. I'll just read you a couple lines from it. He says, yeah. this is Plato. In the days of old, the gods had the whole earth distributed among them by allotment. There was no quarreling, for you cannot rightly suppose that the gods did not know what was proper for each of them to have. So, you know, obviously he has 
the gods deciding this distribution among themselves as opposed to the biblical version where these sorts of you know, any any such arrangement is at the behest you know of 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 the the most high you know to use biblical language right. plato says knowing this that they should seek to procure for themselves by contention that which more properly belonged to others they all of them by just apportionment obtained what they wanted and peopled their own districts <laughs> and when they had peopled them they tended us their nurslings and possessions as shepherds tend their flocks excepting only that they did not use blows or bodily force as shepherds do but governed us like pilots from the stern of a vessel which is an easy way of guiding animals holding our souls by the rudder of persuasion according to their own pleasure thus they did guide all mortal creatures different gods had their allotments in different places which they set in order i mean th- i mean that that is again that's it absent of of the most high again which is obviously really important for biblical theology that's the same idea mm-hmm. you know and, and so when when paul even when paul i mean he's writing to the corinthians he doesn't have to like educate them well you got to get your jewish theology in your heads and then i can talk to you people i mean he 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 can address them on the same basis because this idea was very familiar you know what what's missing of course again is is again the biblical theological element of the most high and of course the most high and the incarnation and all that kind of stuff but you can see the framework for them is already there even as gentiles yeah absolutely I, the, and philo it's interesting because you know philo plato's writing hundreds of uh, mm-hmm. years before philo and when philo's uh, a student of this this these kinds of worldviews he sees it's very congenial this is this is what we've talked about in our scriptures you know this is and he uses deuteronomy 4 to describe that setup of the cosmos mm-hmm. that this is when and he even uses the language from the septuagint of god's creation but he likens it to the election of israel because Deuteronomy 4 is – the grounds for not worshiping those beings is the election of Israel, is having them taken out mm-hmm. from, the, from the power. So they are not under them. Yeah, and, so, and that's, that's perfect with the whole disinheritance or divorce right. idea that happens in, you know, back at Babel, Deuteronomy 32. You're, yeah. you're, you're no, you know, I'm, I'm distancing myself from you and I'm going to elect Israel. I'm going to call, call Abraham. Yeah, and that that yes, the Abraham part is is super important here because the language here in Deuteronomy four, the same list of powers here, the grounds to not worship those beings is because they were allotted to the ethne. They're allotted to the nations. They're yep. not one of them anymore. They they've come out from under them. It's very interesting. And so in where where the Greeks can talk about them as demons. Because it's not all the time. We think that's talked about all the time in the New Testament, just demon, demon, demon. But it's very specific passages that mention them. Mm -hmm. Because in 1 Corinthians, Paul does mention these demons in the same aniconic passages, in the the against idolatry passages. Earlier in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 20 verse 21, Paul says, No, I imply that what the ethne, the nations, sacrifice— they offer to demonies, the demons, and not mm-hmm. to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot yeah, drink it's Deuteronomy the 30. Of the yes, yeah, exactly. De- Deuteronomy 32, 17. That's the passage. That, there it is. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord, table of demons. So what Paul's envisioning here is they've actually come out from under them. They're not actually under their rule anymore. And you see this pop up, this language. People read over this language, and they're not catching the narrative. There's an there's a election narrative going on here where, where Paul talks uh, later in 1 Corinthians 12, 2. He says, you know that when you were ethne, when you were nations, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. You see the, the language there? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's he's drawing on the idolatry section still from this idea from Deuteronomy 4 that you were under them and that made you ethne, right? Because th- those those nations, they have those celestial powers all allotted to them, right? So you were going after those idols however you were led to do so. You know, it's like you were led into doing that by the powers in Paul's mind. 
So he calls them demons just like the Greeks do. So th- this whole idea is you were ethne, but you've been taken out from under them. Now, a lot of Paul scholars in recent scholarship, you know as well as I do, uh, Mike, that this debate over – um, identity in Paul? Are they Jews? Are they? Is it a new thing called Christianity? Are they just practicing Judaism? It's so. These debates are so caught up in kind of the ethnic identity and modern mm-hmm. Jewish Christian relations conversations yeah. Yeah. that they sometimes become ah historical at times, <laughs> and you know, and and it's kind of straying away from the language that Paul's using because Paul, when he's saying that you were pagans, you were nations or ethne. You were Gentiles. He, it's not meaning it's like all of a sudden yeah. you're becoming a Jew, you know, and so right. you're a it's Jew a now. theological. It's a theological category, not yes. an ethnic category. Exactly. It's theological. You, they were under these demons. They were under these powers. But now, all the way back to 1 Corinthians 8 where the conversation began, we don't, we don't have those other gods anymore. We have one God. It's Yahweh. So they picture themselves, whatever's happened, as a new exodus, a new election, which this is an Old Testament concept, right? I mean, the idea of election is exodus in the Old Testament. Take, take the language with Abraham, right? When Abraham's chosen out of the 70 nations, that, that's the Deuteronomy 32 worldview right there in Genesis 10 and 11. He's taken out. He's not one of the 70. Israel or Jacob is not listed in the table of nations because they're not one of them. They're not one of the ethne. They're taken out from them. And by the time you get to Genesis 15 and you have the promise of star-like seed, the thing we talked about in my last interview, what does he tell Moses or what does he tell Abraham right after that uh, vision of the star-like seed? He tells him that I delivered you, Abraham, out of Ur of the Chaldeans. I've purchased you. I've delivered you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. And that phrase in the Hebrew is kind of a stock phrase used all throughout Torah for the Exodus. Mm-hmm. Where, but you just change Ur of the Chaldeans for Egypt. You know, I am the God that delivered you out of Egypt to give you this land to inherit. So he sees election as an Exodus from under the powers. You know, you were under the powers. I elect you, I choose you out from the 70 who I had lauded powers um, over, and you're mine. You're my allotted it, inheritance. It, it makes sense, you know, that, that the Exodus uh, event, you know, and the way that that's written about would, you know, would draw upon the earlier language of, of Abraham for that reason. Because, again, look, look at the way the whole Exodus is set. You know, the Passover, this night I will have victory over the gods of Egypt. You know, so, it, you know, he's... It's this release, you know, from from uh, being under the the dominion, not just of Egyptians, because that's the way we all think of the Exodus, you know, the, yeah. the the physical bondage and slavery. But the plagues are actually directed in the Passover, you know, the the the, the last plague there specifically. Even though it's the death of the firstborn, that that's where you get this language. This night I will have victory over the gods of Egypt. You know, then you get the song of of uh, Moses in Exodus fifteen. You know, who is like you among the Elim? Yeah, you know, just yeah. I mean, it's very consistent, you know, to to have this this thinking that okay, I, just as I rescued Abraham, now I need to rescue, you know, my, you know, the children of Abraham because they're in Egypt, they're in bondage. I've heard their cries and so on and so forth. But but you know, the process of doing that is a release from bondage of the other gods. That's 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 it. And 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 those plagues are also a judgment of those gods, mm-hmm. right? Because so that's really important. And and where you get now, so the real question would become: Well, then, how is this all tied to resurrection? Mm-hmm. But when we're thinking of resurrection with First Corinthians fifteen, we're not importing the narrative view of resurrection that actual Jews have. So from their Old Testament, because where do these ideas of resurrection start coming from? It's Israel was dead. They were alone, you know, they were beaten up, and I delivered them. I brought them to life. It's, it's always election language. It's always Exodus-type language. Um, when you use uh, – when you get to Isaiah 24 through 27, the whole little apocalypse of Isaiah, um, Mike, you know this. You're my thesis reader. I wrote on this in my thesis, but, <laughs> so that, but everyone else hasn't heard it. So in, in, in Isaiah 24, which 24 through 27 is kind of like – what scholars call the chaos comp, you know, is the is ordering the chaos and bringing uh, 
you know, ordering the chaos in creation, bringing order. It's seen as victory over the beast, you know, and there's mm-hmm. the great celebration on the cosmic mountain and all that. Very, very awesome passage. Too much to get into right now. But an important part of that passage is when this thing goes down, when this great new exodus goes down in the future, the way it's talked about is all the nations are judged. And in the judgment of all the nations, in Isaiah um, 24, you have a judgment of the host of heaven and the kings of the earth. Mm-hmm. And that when both. they're – Yeah, both. So you, have the, so you have the gods of the nation idea and the king that rules under them. Because it's common in the ancient world. This is not just a Jewish thing. Everybody thinks their, God, their kings are – you know, part of the family of the God that's over them because gods are territorial, you know, they have the territory, they have a, you know, a tribe, a family. And so the king is a son of the God. That's just a common notion. Kings are treated as gods that way. They're venerated like gods for that reason. So they're part of the divine family. It's patriarchal language, you know, so that, the, but so the kings of the earth are the, the, the hosts of heaven and the kings of the earth are judged. And then there in Isaiah 40, we have this min- – or excuse me, 24, we have this mention that the elders then will see the glory yeah. of God. So yeah, Yahweh's elders. That's, exactly. that's Isaiah 24, 21. Yeah. 24, 21. And what is that drawing on? The Exodus. When, did the, when do we have elders beholding God? Yeah, Exodus 24. Exodus 24, there it is. And you have the 70, surprise, surprise, ascend the cosmic mountain, and and these are human beings. Mm -hmm. So they're going where the gods go. In the the Baal epic, Atirat, um, Baal's consort, um, invites all the divine council, which in other places in the Baal epic are called the assembly of the stars or the sons of God or just the assembly of the gods. Um, And they're called there the 70 sons of Atirat. The 70 sons ascend the cosmic mountain to celebrate this, the parting of the sea or the slaying of the sea. You know, this is, this is an archetypical thing going on um, in the Hebrew Bible where you have in Exodus 24, the elect ones, the ones who are taken out from under the powers have now ascended the cosmic mountain and they now, the 70 of them, surprise, surprise, uh, like the 70 nations, are taking up their function or role as part of what ancient Near Eastern people would have seen only as a role of the divine council. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Isaiah is drawing on that stuff and saying, look, when these hosts of heaven are judged and the kings of the earth are judged, the elders will behold the glory. And there's going to be – and you fast forward to through Isaiah 24 through 27, and what do you find? You find – the cosmic mountain, you find a great feast because they ate with the Lord back in Exodus 24. They're eating with them again, but this time all the nations will come to the mountain. Yeah, so, you, we, I should jump in here just, just for yeah. listeners' sake. This whole – all this talk that you hear about in evangelical, especially prophecy circles, prophecy talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, that has deep, deep – Old Testament roots and specifically divine counsel kind of stuff. That's right. This this whole celebratory supper of the victory of the Lamb. Okay, I, I hope you're listening because this is that's actually what David is just talking about here. But it goes back to this Deuteronomy four, Exodus twenty four, all the you know this this concatenation of ideas that when the gods are judged. Okay, think of the Exodus. You know, the, the gods are judged. You know, this night I will have victory over the gods of Egypt. We have the crossing of the sea. In other words, passing through the waters, untouched by the waters. The waters, of course, being the chaos imagery, you know, common throughout the Old Testament. Right, right. So we have victory over chaos. Who is like you among the gods? You know, we go to Sinai. We make it to Sinai, and there the seventy ascend to the to the mountain top of, of Sinai and have a meal. With the God of Israel, Exodus 24, they saw the God of Israel. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer. And the number is significant, you know, just like you're pointing out. But all of this is backdrop, backstory to this thing, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But when we hear that taught in church, I mean, good grief, it's stripped of just about everything we just talked about. Yeah. (laughs) Because none of that comes along. Right. Because 
what we'll do, we're so piecemeal with some of these texts where that you can't just rip these out of this deep narrative context. Mm -hmm. When Paul is drawing on, say, these creature lists, this is part of a much deeper narrative that's going on. Um, and he believes this is this is an eschatological exodus out from under the powers. You were ethne, you're no longer ethne. You know, you were under the demons, you're not under them anymore. You have one God. Sure, and, there's and ultimately, gods. yeah, I, I know where you're going with this now. And, and ultimately, mm -hmm. again, we we have this 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 creaturely list in First Corinthians 15 tied in with the resurrection because your ultimate deliverance out from under the gods is going to happen at the resurrection. And Bingo. oh, by the way, by the way, your resurrection is also a key element to you displacing them, you know, the gods of the nations and replacing right. them, becoming the reconstituted, you know, divine council. Yes. Under, which under is the true God. Right. Sons of God. Yep. Um, even the terms that Paul uses, it's it's amazing how we can look over these terms and not know all their weighted meaning. It, when Paul calls his congregation that have received the pneuma, the spirit, or the pnefma, um, when they receive this, he calls them holy ones. Yeah. And he even calls them the assembly of the holy ones, right? <laughs> the church. That's that's right out of that's right yeah. out of Psalm eighty nine. Where it's used, who amongst the assembly of the holy ones is yeah. like you, Yahweh, the gods. Yeah, it's divine counsel terminal. That's why I, I just – it's one of the few things that, that I just really dislike across the board about English translations, you know, using a term like saints. Yes, it's I mean, It just – you lose every attachment to the Old Testament imagery when you, when you dump holy ones and, and use something like saints. And, it, you know, it's not a coincidence – that every time you almost almost every time Paul uses that language, like in the opening of the letter, you know, to the holy ones in Ephesus or to the holy ones in Corinth, he's attaching it to uh, uh, who follow the Lord, um, and they they he will say things like our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they appeal to God as Father, meaning that them being holy ones are already counted as sons of God. They're mm -hmm. already functionally. And ontologically, because they have the pnefma, the spirit, they're already sons of God in that sense. And so that, that's very important. So what, why – again, back to the First Corinthians 15 thing with some of this background. The list follows perfectly that list from Deuteronomy 4. So why that list? Because we saw in Philo – the, the the these powers there's not anything really wrong with them you know just don't worship them as gods alone right well that's philo is not an apocalypticist he's a platonist he doesn't think that these powers need to be judged he doesn't talk about it he never goes to these texts but is there another text though that would give us a narrative for these powers these same powers from deuteronomy that i think paul is drawing on here are actually judged in conjunction with a resurrection? And the answer is yes, there is a passage, and it's the one we talk about all the time, and it's Psalm 82. Mm -hmm. Because in Psalm 82, that passage, uh, talking about the judgment of the gods, ends in the last two verses this way. He says, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you, but you are dying like men, or you will die like men in the Hebrew. And like one of the rulers in Greek, the archonton, mm -hmm. the same term that Paul <laughs> uses for the powers, <laughs> right. same term, he Septuagint, says you will fall yeah. in the Septuagint. Now, it gets yeah. better, Mike. It gets better. But That's, wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah, but wait, there's more. So, God, so whoever this God figure is, in, in Psalm 82 that's listed at the beginning, the God stands in the assembly of the gods, and in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Whoever this is, and by the way, he's getting on to them because he says, how long will you judge unjustly? Which is the whole point. The way Philo talks about it, the way Plato talks about it, look, they know these powers are supposed to rule in justice. They're supposed to copy the rule of the father of all. They're supposed to rule in justice and law, keep the order of, of things. But the, the critique of Psalm 82 is, um, Psalm 81 in the Septuagint, is that they have not done this. They have not judged rightly. They have judged unjustly. So that's where you get to this critique, and he goes into describing the injustice they've done. 
But that's where you get the critique at the end that I said you're gods, sons of the Most High, all of you, but you're dying like men. So see, like men, they're going to die. This is very important. So only men die. The celestial bodies, the celestial gods, they don't die. So they're immortals. They're made of different stuff than man. Man dies. But they are going to die like men. They're like one of the rulers, the archonton, you will fall. And now the psalmist comes in. And in the Greek, this is very important. In the Greek, you actually have yeah, I'm looking um, at it. The, term, the term, arise, O God. So whoever this God figure is in Psalm 82, the psalmist now is speaking to close out the psalm. And he says, right. the cry that, of the psalmist is, arise, O God, and judge the earth, because you will obtain inheritance in all the nations or of all the nations. So the, the arising here, surprise, surprise, is anasta in Greek. Yeah, this the resurrection the term. term. Exactly. This is the term in the New Testament. Every time it's used, the anastasis or the anastas, this is the term used for resurrection. That, that, that's really interesting because you can see how Paul, if he has this, this matrix of ideas in his head, could, could very easily see a double entendre in that verse. In other words, it's not just the psalmist pleading, you know, logically in, in Old Testament theology for God to, you know, take back the nations to inherit them. But here, because of the resurrection language, you could see that Paul could be thinking of believers. Yeah. Well, and but he's it's specifically this God figure, whoever it is, you know, yeah, arises. I, 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 you know, I, it, you could you could put Chris, you could see Christology in there very easily. I think too. Yep. Th- I think this is where Paul is getting the narrative in First Corinthians fifteen. Oh, that now, that would be, yeah. Boy. This is now. Let me wait, let me show wait, this. Wait, to you. Let me. Where do you this. read? Where do you read that in at SPL? That'll be awesome. Go, yeah, go watch, ahead. Now watch this. This is going to blow your mind when you go to First Corinthians fifteen. 20, um, but before the passage we're talking about, the nature of resurrection body, he has a little mini apocalyptic narrative of what the resurrection's about. So if you want to know, if you're asking the question, man, what does Paul think is happening with this resurrection thing? What's the resurrection thing all about? He gives you like a little narrative into kind of what's happening in this whole resurrection thing. It's going on. Why is the re- resurrection such a big deal? Is it just some kind of miracle tacked on to the atonement that God received his sacrifice? Or is there way more than that? Well, Paul thinks there's way more than that. Because he says, in, in this is back in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 through 28. Listen to this. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Now, th- it's important here the language that Paul's using. In 1 Corinthians 15, I have to note this because people look over this. He doesn't always use the term anastasis. He doesn't always use it. When he uses, throughout the passage, he'll use egiro, which is just to rise up or to to pull up, up, you know, to raise up. Um, But whenever he uses anastasis, it's always like a title of the event. This is the event. It's called the Anastasis Necron, or right. it's the so the act the act of the event the the imagery of of what happens is Egero raise yeah. up, right? And, but the event itself is referenced as Anastasis, exactly. Yeah. So the, the event every time Paul does it, if you know Greek or you're looking at the Greek, um, you, you can see this. Mm-hmm. He when he describes the event, it n- names the event. It's the resurrection. And then he, when he uses raising up, it's always that other term. Now, that's significant because if he's drawing on Psalm 82, this means Psalm 82 has been around for a long time. And people have developed a narrative with that where it becomes like this event that people are waiting on. You know, when is this judgment of the gods going to happen? When is God going to rise up and take control? Well, so that's the event itself, the anastasis or the anasta, right? So Paul de- is describing this event. He says, verse 21, for as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. So you see, he sees this as a big event. So in the first creation, man brought death with him. But in this event, the resurrection of the dead, something has changed, right? So he's like, verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall, or in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, what we would think of this all being made alive passage 
is it's like, oh, well, then they'll all get up from the grave too. But we know Paul doesn't think everyone gets a resurrection unto life. And, and we know that um, this language of being made alive is used more than just physically getting up out of the grave because it's used all the time of bringing nations back to life and delivering them from the grave. You know, they're an impression in Egypt and I've brought them to life. So it's kind of a restoration uh, um, language of bring, making things alive. You know, Adam's, ru- Adam's rule, when he welcomed the evil ones in, it just brought death to everything. But then when Christ's rule comes in, all shall be made alive. So it brings life, right? Because that's how they read those um, uh, putting the powers over the nations. That's how Plato understands it. That's how Deuteronomy understands it. This is supposed to order the cosmos, right? This is supposed to set it all up, you know, balance everything out, set up the order so that life can go on in God's world. And so this is what's happening with the resurrection is all are going to be made alive, right? So in verse 23, he says, but in each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. So there's our uh, sowing metaphor that he's going to use in the nature of the resurrection body talk, right? So Christ, the first fruits, and then at his coming or at his parousia, those who belong to Christ. Now, if, if you've studied New Testament before, um, or if any of the listeners have studied the parousia before, the coming of Christ, um, you may have come across this idea that parousia is you have in, – in the Greco-Roman world, this is very common. It's common in the Semitic world too. Ancient, ancient Hebrews would understand this concept as well. When the, when, the, when the king goes off to do warfare against the bad guys and all you, all you guys are staying at home, you don't know what's going on. You don't know how the victory is going. You're at home. You're biting your nails. You know, is our king dead? Has our armies lost? What's the deal? He's gone off to fight for us. You know, and so you're waiting on that runner to come back, right? You're waiting. This is that ancient thing. You know, if you've studied marathon, you know, they did that in Greece. You know, the runner comes back to tell how the victory has gone. Well, that's when you first see the term gospel in Isaiah. The first, ter- the first time you see the term good news, because this passage is about the good news. It's how he starts the whole thing is the gospel. And he's like, when you first see that being used, it's the one, how beautiful are the feet of the one bringing the good news, saying our God reigns, meaning the runner has run back and told us that God has secured the victory. And so the parousia is the coming is where you'd go out to meet him after he's coming back from conquest. You have the messengers on the wall and they look and he's come, he's come. And there's a big parade and pomp and circumstance welcoming the God King back after he's conquered to the city to celebrate. So at his parousia, Paul is saying, all those who belong to Christ as well. So it's picturing Christ in this kind of conquering king imagery of the one who's gone to do battle. And that's how he understands the resurrection. And if you don't believe me, well, let's keep reading. (laughs) Paul says in verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the father after what? Destroying every rule, every authority and power. And guess what the terms are he uses here? (laughs) The same terms used from Deuteronomy 4, when Philo reads it, when others read it, of the principalities and powers, which are the celestial bodies who rule over the nations. He's destroying them. He is the conquering king, and upon his resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, is destroying the rulers. Mm -hmm. And what did we have in Psalm 82? At the yeah. arising of God, it's at the destruction of the rulers. But that that's really interesting because I mean uh, there are several things here that I, and I'm sure people are catching them at least if if they're regular listeners here. But it's it's another one of these already but not yet kinds of things. Yes. In other words, if if you're going to talk about the inauguration of the kingdom and you're going to connect that with the resurrection and the and the you know and even before that the kingdom being inaugurated by you know Jesus sending out drum roll, please, the 70, okay, and That's right. you know, giving them power over demonic forces, you know, you, you have all of these things that that inaugurate the kingdom and, and again, move it along, kickstart it, kick it down the road, keep it moving, you know, uh, inexorably, you know, until the, you know, the, the ultimate, you know, consummation of all these things, 
you know, when we are put over the nations, to him that overcomes, I will put over the nations. To him that overcomes, I will, you know, share the, the rod of iron that they will rule the nations with. You know, Revelation 2 and 3, where Jesus quotes a messianic psalm and applies right. it to us. I mean, just this crazy kind of talk. <laughs> well, w- but yeah, it's but very what, consistent. Watch what Paul does with this, though, because his whole destroying every rule and power, he has something in mind that he's drawing on. He says in verse 25, for, for he, Christ, must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Mm-hmm. So what, what passage is he drawing on here? The enemies under his feet. This is Psalm 110, mm-hmm. putting the enemies under his yep. feet. Yep. Now, the question then becomes, well, you know, David, if, is this really drawing on Psalm 82? I mean, do you have any example in early Judaism, where that actually happens, where people are using Psalm 82 to talk about the judgment of the gods and all that. Is that really what he's talking about? Yes, we do. Surprise, surprise. Thanks to Qumran. When we, when we dig up Qumran, we found this text, 11Q Melchizedek, about Melchizedek, and it uses Psalm 82 in the same way and, and even makes the connection. This is Melchizedek from Psalm 110. Th- these these yeah, connections connects, are, connects the two passages. Yeah. Exactly. It's connecting Psalm 110, the Melchizedek figure, to the person who comes in, in Psalm 82. I'll read the passage from 11Q Melchizedek. This is from Qumran. It says, and the, it's the time of the year of grace of Melchizedek and of his armies, the nation of the holy ones of God. Surprise, surprise here. <laughs> of the rule of judgment. As it is written about him in the songs of David, who said, Psalm 82. It's interesting, he calls it a Psalm of David. In the Hebrew canon, it's a Psalm yeah, of Asaph. A psalm, That's, yeah. yeah, interesting. But um, he said, who said, Psalm 82, 1, quote, God will stand in the assembly of the gods in the midst of the gods he judges. And about him, Melchizedek, he said, from Psalm 7, 8 and 9, and above it to the heights return, God will judge the peoples. So this judgment figure is this Melchizedek figure, this redeemer figure who comes and does it. It's not Yahweh himself. It's Melchizedek who's the agent of Yahweh going and destroying the powers and, and inheriting or judging the peoples. He says, as for what he said, Psalm 82, 2, how long will you ju- judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And then the interpreter says, its interpretation concerns Belial and the spirits of his lot. So it's the allotted His allotment, spirit. Yeah. There's the allotment language. He says, who turning aside from the commandments of God to commit evil, but Melchizedek, who will carry out the vengeance of God's, of God's judgments. And on that day, he will free them from the hand of Belial and from the hand of all the spirits of his lot. Mm-hmm. So, so already they're reading this as an eschatological event. Yeah where you have the Redeemer figure coming with his holy ones to judge the gods and to redeem them from that those evil allotment using mm-hmm. Psalm 82 in the same way. Yeah, and so you, for, for listeners, you know, this is a pre-Christian text. You know, so Paul comes along and, and using the same language, you know, fixes this to, to what happened on the cross, you know, to, to uh, the event of the cross and the resurrection and of course, the inauguration of the kingdom you know, that, that we read about in, in the New Testament. You, you know what else the, the, the victory image, uh, imagery reminds me of is Psalm 68. Mm-hmm. You know, because, and for those who have read Unseen Realm, you know, I, I talk about Psalm 68, Mount of Bashan, of course. And then, then you get this connection, of course, Mount Bashan. Well, there's only one mountain at the, in the region of Bashan way up north there, and that was Hermon. Right. You know, right. And you get the whole Watchers thing going on and... You know, so there, there you have plural agents to the one, you know, big bad guy of the realm. You know, the, the gateways to the netherworld, mm-hmm. Ashtaroth and Edri and the Lord of the Dead, and I mean, all of these things connect together. And that's the passage, of course, Paul uh, quotes about Christ ascending, you know, the resurrection, and then, then, the, then the coming of the Spirit, you know, and and the church, the the church who against whom the gates of hell will not be able to withstand. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're, they're the ones that in connection with this, this event, they get the, the pastors and the, you know, the prophets and the, you know, the apostles and the teachers and, and the whole grocery list there. I mean, right. all of these points, again, I'm, I'm hoping listeners catch this. Basically, nothing that David has talked about today 
works in isolation from any of the other points that's right David has brought up today that's right they're, they're all interconnected it is a matrix of ideas that's right that and it's it's a it's an ongoing narrative and it's an expectation that this narrative has a climax in the resurrection that's that's how they're understanding it and by the way that that this 11 q melchizedek text it goes on immediately in the next line and says that to his aid, to Melchizedek's aid, shall come all the gods of justice. And so these, these, there's good gods, whoever they are, mm-hmm. are coming to aid Melchizedek in the destruction of Belial and the other spirits to redeem the people. Um, so there's already divine figures involved in this. Are you, he, are you looking at the Hebrew text for the gods of justice there? The, I'm wondering what the word justice is. Uh, I could look at it. You could continue. Yeah, I have the diglot here. Okay. Um, so, well, I need I need to make this point. He says, and he there's a, there's a bunch of lacunas here. There's a mention of the sons of God, and like lacunas are spaces where we don't have text. And so there's these spaces here we don't have text. It's like who blank 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 all the sons of God blank blank this blank blank. And then you have a mention of what I just mentioned earlier with Isaiah. The the author says is the day of peace about which he said, and then there's a blank, through Isaiah the prophet who said, Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, the messenger of good news who announces salvation, saying to Zion, your Mm -hmm. God reigns. Mm -hmm. This is the idea. So the narrative is already there in their minds. And Hundreds of years before Jesus, we have this, this, this is developed for a while. Psalm 82 is being used in an eschatological way. So you have this redeemer figure who goes and judges the gods. He's going to save the people from the hands of Belial and the spirits of his lot. He's going to deliver them. In Paul's case, the rulers, the principalities, the powers. And as a result, they are going to be destroyed. And that's when the, that's the good news that's announced is that this is happening. This is the good news. It's salvation. It's, it's new exodus. It's we're being delivered out from under the powers. You know, the powers are being destroyed. That's the narrative that Paul is drawing on. This is, he, he, this is what's happening in Christ's resurrection. This isn't just like, hey, good job on the cross. You can come to heaven now, and it's all done. It's like, no, you, you're, being, you're ascending into heaven, and cosmic warfare is going down. You are deli- you are destroying the principalities and powers, and as a result, others are going to join him at his coming. Those who belong to Christ, so Christ, mm-hmm. whatever has happened to Christ then in his resurrection will also happen to his. And this is the point with when he actually gets into the nature of the resurrection body in verse thirty-five through fifty there that we read. And this is why he draws his list from Deuteronomy 4 instead, because at this resurrection, it's being seen as this new exodus, this new election. It's out from under the powers. When you go to die, the seed goes in the ground. It does not come out the same thing. The the earthly body is made of flesh. You've talked about this in the previous podcast. Mm -hmm. And then the heavenly body is of glory. Now, we see another connection with this language from Deuteronomy 4. You remember me mentioning that uh, Deuteronomy 4 talks about the likeness, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we see that, and you talked about this in your podcast, and I I was a little bit frustrated you already talked about it because I wanted to mention it, but you beat me to it, (laughs) Um, is the language from Ezekiel 1. Mm -hmm. When you see the heavenly one, uh, the glory of Yahweh, He's actually, it says he's in the likeness of a human being. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same term, the omioma in Greek is the same term that's being used in Deuteronomy 4. And it's the same term used in Philippians. So the, Paul's thinking in this general idea that it is the likeness of a human form, but it is not the same stuff. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is celestial. It is like the gods. That's what the body is like. And we already have precedent for this in passages, of course, like Daniel 12, where, where the resurrection, it's at the arising of Michael, surprise, surprise. And in the Greek, it's the same anasta. And, and they're reading, and many commentators say Daniel 12 is reading Psalm 82's tradition of the arising 
and the conquering of the foes. Because Daniel 8, you have that falling language that Psalm 82 uses of the stars or that are the hosts of heaven. Mm -hmm. And then you have the mention of those princes of heaven who are cosmically fighting in the heavens against Israel's messenger, Mike, against the messenger that comes and against Michael, Israel's chief prince. So when, when, when that chief figure, when that chief heavenly figure defeats the other princes and arises that's in Daniel 12 when the resurrection takes place. Once Michael has arised victorious, so too the resurrection happens, and you all shine as the stars of heaven. You know, you know what's really interesting about this? And, and again, we're not – well, I'll just say it this way. If, you're, if you think okay, in, in all of this rising Michael you know, talk, if, if listeners sort of just try at least you know, for, for this moment – to not think of their own resurrection, in other words, to not think of of the uh, the end times, you know, the ultimate consummation right. of this. If you if you think about Jesus, you know where else you see this combination? You see it in Revelation twelve, okay, the, yep. the, the the war in heaven passage, and you know I, I've spent a lot of commentary, you know, on, on like look. Again, this has nothing to do with some primeval rebellion that comes from Milton's Paradise Lost or the 19th century, the gap theory or all this kind of stuff. If you look at the passage, this this war in heaven happens in conjunction with, again, it, it, I'm not alone here, but my view that you have the birth, you have, you have astral signage of the birth of the Messiah, mm. you have the war in heaven, and then you also have him being caught up. Okay, yep. you have you have the you have the resurrection language, and so it would be another indicator that all of this—the kingdom, the resurrection, the the defeat again of the powers—has already been launched. Okay, it, it's already in motion. It's already happening. Right. It's not something completely you know wait until the end. It's right now. So again, you you have this whole matrix of ideas, and the reason I there's a specific reason I'm bringing this up because a number of our listeners, especially those who were, you know, touched in some way by the Fern and Audrey episode, and their their ministry to uh, you know survivors of ritual trauma, a, a lot of which involves very bad theological messaging. A lot of those people are frankly in, in, enslaved. Uh, by by thoughts of uh, being owned by Satan, and you know they can't have victory. You know they 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 they're God hates them because of what happened to them. All this kind of stuff, and it's all tied into this 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 notion that they are abandoned and that they uh, there, there's no sort of recourse uh, to defeat you know the, the the powers. You know you're just going to die like you are, and all this kind of stuff. It, it's just a lot of bad thinking. And one of the reasons why you know the that. Fern and Audrey have found the divine council stuff so helpful is because it focuses on the enactment of the of the already present victory or and another way of saying that is the already present defeat of the powers so here we go again here we yeah. go again it, it it's the same again set of ideas drawing you know here we here we are starting in first Corinthians fifteen you wind up back in deuteronomy and you get the whole matrix of ideas again. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, and so I guess to wrap up this na nature of the body thing, when we go back to the original passage we're talking about, this 1 Corinthians 15 passage, this the, the whole question in verse 35 is, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come? Mm -hmm. So it's what kind of bodies are these? And you talked about that in your previous podcast. But the important part here is, those fleshly creatures are the ones from Deuteronomy 4 that are ruled over by the celestial creatures. And so yet this is not just a question of the nature and, and the, the kind of stuff the body's made out of. This is also talking about their actual roles. Mm -hmm. Because th these these fleshly creatures, the humans, animals, birds, fish, that's all the first order from Deuteronomy 4. And then the next order is the, the glorious ones, the sun, moon, and other stars. Do you, do you, do you realize – I mean I know you do, but, but folks, you got to listen to this. Because what David's describing is the return to the correct Edenic relationship where the sons of God, okay, the family of God, instead of worshiping the creature <laughs> – 
being dominated by other gods, everything is corrected. It is brought back into proper order in in this this consummated new earth. You know this this eternal existence. You know with with us ruling over the nations. There's a global Eden. All this you know this concatenation concatenation of ideas again. I'll try not to interrupt you again, but I mean it's like that. No, it's, it's, it's that's just so cool. It, it's amazing, really, because in. There's a lot of scholars who, unfortunately, I think get this wrong. And I want to be humble because, you know, I'm still a young guy in all this. But there's this when we when we when we're so quick to rush to apologetic answers for the resurrection, like, well, let me prove it to you. There's here's first Corinthians 15 right here, you know, and you, you'll you miss all of the Jewish background to this, all of the Old Testament background to this, th- th- this is an v- incredibly carefully put together passage. And this, this is where it connects with the Abrahamic promise thing. Because the Abrahamic promise thing um, th- that we talked about in my previous interview, and my articles finally come out after all this time, it's finally in print, it's in, if, it's in libraries of major that has good biblical studies resources, Journal for Study of Paul and His Letters, Volume 5.2. You can go buy it on their website if you like. It's, uh, it's $15. I don't get a dime, so don't think I'm getting money out of this. <laughs> you know, The but publisher makes sure of that. <laughs> yeah, the publisher makes sure I'm not getting nothing out of that. But it's a journal. I don't blame them. So the, the point is, I've talked about this before, that this is how early Jews – are understanding the promise to Abraham in the end is that the promise to Abraham in the end is that our that his seed would become like the stars that is how they understand this and in the Abrahamic promise the promise the evangelia is close to what we understand as evangelion the good news or gospel when um, P- Paul says this in Galatians, you know, the gospel was preached to Abraham when he was told that the nations would be blessed by his seed, right? That was the gospel. Mm-hmm. And this, again, 1 Corinthians 15 is about the gospel. And when when we don't read this in its proper narrative context, you're not going to understand the nature of the body passage because already it's framed. It, Paul even gives us like a little parentheses to frame this whole discussion in, and it's the kingdom of God. That's the, the language that he's drawing on. From in the 2028 passage where he narrates to you what's happening in the resurrection, he says – it's he must deliver the kingdom to God after destroying the powers, right? And so then God will be all in all once it's all once it's all done and everything's in subjection to him. And, and look and at so, Galatians three, the gospel preached beforehand to Abraham. What what does he say? He quotes the covenant, and you shall all nations be blessed. Exactly. <laughs> You're going to be set free 3. from these powers. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 freedom. It's it's election. It's the seed of Abraham. You're chosen out from the nations. It's happening on a gl- cosmic scale. It's cosmic election. It's cosmic exodus. It, this is a huge event. The resurrection that he's talking about. The event he's getting from that Psalm 82 Deuteronomy worldview. That's how he understands it. Is that no longer you're not just nations anymore because if you're nations you're under the demons you're still eating with the demons you're not eating this great supper when we get together with the one god and one lord and how does he talk about that if he's drawing on the exodus we should see it if that's what he's talking about and that's exactly what you see in first corinthians 10 right smack in the middle of this whole long section on idolatry he says hey it was our fathers that were that were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the fire, and they ate the the spiritual food and drank from the same spiritual drink from the rock which followed them, which was Christ. He's like, so Paul is already narrating their whole experience of baptism, receipt of the Spirit, as going down into the waters, going through the waters, coming out the other side in Exodus, death raised to walk in newness of life. You see the same stuff in Romans. You see the same stuff in Colossians. Transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. This is the big, this is the big narrative 
this happens. The new exodus, you go into baptism unto death, and you're raised to newness of life. Yeah, you're I mean, no just, longer yeah. under the powers. Look, look at the baptism in imagery. Powers. Yeah. It's it's very important. I mean, it just it just this just you know leaks into all sorts of New it Testament theological there. elements. But the, but the important part is is lots of scholars have missed this language of saying, well, Paul doesn't think they're actually going to become celestial bodies. Well, yes, he does, <laughs> because we have a misunderstanding of what Paul means by that. Mm -hmm. Normally, when apologists are saying, no, 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 he's not saying they become stars. It's he understands them to be the gods. These are the powers from Deuteronomy. These are the ones that have dominion and authority. He even uses the language like we've pointed out. Yeah, they're going to become the divine. Yeah. Yes, it, this is a deification passage. Resurrection is not just... Hey, you get back up and you got the look, another little human body just like you had before. No, it is a different thing. And this is what, and if you listen carefully, you can hear the language. And when he's describing the, the polarization, there's a good book on polarity and change in 1 Corinthians by Asher um, about this, like where he's like, uh, so too is it with the resurrection of the dead? What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. These are terms used by Philo and other Jews to describe the powers. They're imperishable. The Stoics use that language to talk about the, the pneumatic beings, the spirit beings. They're right. imperishable. Whatever, so, whatever, whatever that body is made of, it's made of stuff that's imperishable. Right. Just like, just like, just like those those beings who are imperishable. And it's sown in dishonor. So here's the sowing metaphor coming back. The seed. It's sown in dishonor. So you put the seed in the ground, it dies, mm -hmm. and it's raised in glory. Glory is the language he's used glory, for these like celestial so. creatures. They are of glory. And what what a lot of English translations will mess up is in verse forty. But it, where he says when he splits the the celestial and the earthly, you know, and he says there are heaven, there are celestial bodies and there's terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and of the earthly is another. Is how it should read. But they always add another glory in there. <laughs> they say, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and mm -hmm. the glory of yeah, the earthly yeah, yeah. is another. But yeah. he doesn't use the term glory for the earthly. Right, right. He never does. He says the glory of the celestial is of one kind and of the earthly is another. Yeah, it's so, a good example of an English translator trying to help and not and messing exactly. it up. Yeah. They, they mess it up. The same with the, the whole promise to Abraham thing. When people try to uh, interpret that, they add the term numerous in there. They're like, and so numerous shall your seed be. Even though he doesn't ever say numerous, he says, so shall your seed be like the stars. So this, this is the, where this is coming from, I think. This is the climax of the promise because in the resurrection out of Daniel 12, and a host of other traditions in Second Temple period. You can find it in 1 Enoch 104, 2 through 6. You can find it in 2 Baruch 51, 1 through 12. You can find it in 4 Ezra 7, 97. You can find it in Testament of Moses, on and on. I could, uh, an important one you can look up later is 4 Maccabees 17, 5 through 6, that retells the resurrection of the uh, of the sons of the hope for the resurrection of the sons from Second Maccabees seven, it retells the story and and climaxes with how August is the this faithful mother. She's like the moon. She outshines the moon, and and your your um your sons are like stars, and truly are they sons of Abraham. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's it's so obvious. This is how the Jews interpret apocalyptically like the the climax of this narrative the promise of abraham they become like the stars and what was the promise the seed it's the seed and this is exactly why paul is using the metaphor here this is because in his mind is this promise of becoming like the stars in the resurrection and he understands that as the seed of abraham and so that seed of the new pnefma, the seed of the spirit comes in, it's planted, and that sucker dies, and what comes out is the spiritual body. It is the resurrection, and the promise is fulfilled, and they take up the dominion. And if, mm -hmm. if you think, well, what? This is all there in 1 Corinthians? Well, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 6, this is the giveaway. 
in 1 Corinthians 6, he uses the same language that connects all this dots from this kind of matrix of text that we're talking about. If you remember the passage, he says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the holy ones? Or do you know that the holy ones will judge the cosmos? Mm -hmm. And the language is the exact same language of judging uh, Krinite or Krinusin mm -hmm. that's from Psalm 82. Mm -hmm. The judgment um, is, is connected to the inheritance. The inheritance language of the nations is from Abrahamic promise. Yep. And then judging and it's all the connected. angels in the next line. And in the yeah. very next line. And if the cosmos is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? So this is, he's already drawing on this narrative, on this understanding, long before you get to 1 Corinthians 15. So it should, by that time, if we know these texts, if we know this complex of thinking, it should become obvious. But see, what started out as, man, we're just getting the background text wrong, develops into, it's not just the background text we're getting wrong. It's when we get that background text wrong, we're not seeing the whole narrative that Paul's drawing on. Right. Right. And how he actually understands what is taking place in the resurrection. And the last thing I'll say about that is, well, David, what about the Adam stuff? Because he says the first Adam and the last Adam, isn't that from Genesis? Well, if you know your Old Testament like a Jew knows his, you know Adam isn't only about Genesis 1 and 2. Adam and the sons of Adam go all the way up into Genesis 11. So when you're thinking Adam as a Jew, you're, not, you're elected out from under those guys. You know, all those nations, they're the sons of Adam. We're not part of them anymore. We're not part of the nations anymore. We're a whole nother thing. We're a kingdom of priests. They're all the sons of Adam. They're all the ones that have gone astray. We're the ones that worship the true God. So they are, it, from a Jewish perspective, you could say, well, all those nations, they're still in Adam in that sense. They're still the ethne. They're still divided amongst the gods. Yeah, but so, believers, are, believers are united to the new Adam. The second right. Adam, you know, in, in again, back back to a global Eden, everything is brought back full circle and corrected and made as it should have been. Mm -hmm. And he's using Adam as a as a, a extremely powerful metaphor because he's playing on the dust language mm -hmm. um, from Genesis from Genesis uh, two of uh, being made from the dust. Yeah. But but what is he talking about? He's talking about the seed. That that old humanity that used to be enslaved to the powers, when that goes in the ground, once it's been planted from heaven, because you're of heaven, you're from the man of heaven, which is the life-giving spirit. Yeah. So when he's giving us that spirit that's life-giving, that's the seed. And when that old humanity goes back to the dust, to dust you will return, death, right? That's the whole issue is death. They go down and die. The seed's planted. And what comes out the other side? This is the celestial. This is a whole new humanity. Yeah, who, who would your fine humanity? Who would you rather be united to, the first Adam or the second one? Right, right. You know, and it, <laughs> it's, it's kind a, of an obvious yeah. answer. <laughs> but Paul's rhetoric is so brilliant here. I mean, that connecting the seed to the man of dust, to all the nations, to the deliverance out from under the powers. This is all his big, epic, apocalyptic narrative of the resurrection. It's so much bigger than just getting up out of the grave. Wow. Well, I, you know, just, just to wrap up here, I will, I'm not going to give a name here, but and you might know who it is, but don't, don't spill the beans here, but just a, an Old Testament scholar and friend who uh, I, I can just remember several years ago, getting into a little discussion about divine counsel. And, and what he actually said was, I don't really know how any of that, ha what any of that has to do with the new Testament. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Oh, well, but it's I'm, like, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to keep yeah. the guilty parties uh, from being yeah. revealed. Boy, it just sure. Be warmed and filled, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for their sake, look, and you know, Mike, it's, it's, it's really sad because there a lot of New Testament scholars, and I don't blame them. I mean, there listen, there is just droves and droves and droves of literature being published all the time, and New Testament scholars are up to their ears. I mean, 
No, that's that's real. You no, know, it's like they just can't. They and some of them in their ed- early education, it didn't do a lot of ancient Near Eastern studies. You know, they didn't do a lot of contextual study of the Old Testament, so they miss some of that images and some of the language that frames the whole stinking meta narrative. Yeah. And so, when you miss those key parts, like early on, and you're trying to piece together these narratives in their original context, you're not actually reading the whole context. Yeah. Well, th- thanks for that. I mean, that was that was great. That was I mean, a long just, episode here. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it was. But it, it, I mean, yeah. But I mean, that just has so much good stuff in it. Again, just this matrix of ideas. And that's what I'm hoping people see that that the these things that we talk about, you know, divine counsel stuff, it's not just in isolation. These aren't just sort of arcane observations of of trivial curiosities. I mean, th- this stuff filters down into New Testament theology in really, really significant ways. So I'm, I'm glad, glad you were able to come back on and, uh, you know, give us the gist of the paper. And I, I can hardly wait for the Q and A at SPL. It just, I mean, in, in a good way because I'm always, I, I'm just going to be curious because it's, a, it's basically going to be a group of New Testament people. Yep. I'm willing to bet 90% of the of the scholars in that room will just be kind of looking around like what in the world just hit us you know like they they just won't have the framework but I it, it's always interesting to see what surfaces uh in the Q&A and and who's kind of who's got the framework and who doesn't and and you know what you need to what you need to work on it's actually good direction you know for what what uh, needs to be worked on yep Yep. Well, I'm curious, when you talk to other scholars about the framework, what kind of reaction do you get? Do they seem open to it or do they just shut you down or do they go back and process it and come back? I mean, yeah. what's the feedback you get? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll give you an example. The, the Two weeks ago when I gave the paper at the regional um, SBL, uh, there is about, you know, 15 people in the room. It's a small room. And um that I asked when I was done with the paper and the chair of the session was like, okay, uh, open for questions and answers, you know? And, and, uh, it was just kind of like, everyone's mouth is kind of like, what just happened, <laughs> you know? And, and looking at me like, what? And, and I'm like, so I've convinced all of you, you know? And, and I got a lot of nods like, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I don't, they didn't know what to say. Right. And I, I, I got a couple of, uh, good questions toward the end, um, and some scholars who are really open to it, some young scholars uh, that were really open to it. I know uh, Michael Thompson from Erdman's had come in and listened to my paper and uh, from Erdman's Publishing, and he's he's been interested and he's been following my work, and I think I think he's tracking with me now. I've had to explain some of this stuff to him, but um, so some of them are catching on to this, and and I think. Some of them, like Mike says, are just deer in the headlights type deal. But, but I tell you what, that I mentioned him before. But Matthew Teeson, who um, was teaching at St. Louis University, who's now moving to McMaster, in his book Paul and the Gentile Problem, he get he nails it with the Abrahamic promise. Mm-hmm. We basically say the same thing. So um, I, mine is, but I have all the divine counsel background in mine. So, but he gets the he gets the New Testament appropriation of the promise right, and he connects it. Um, he even connects it to the resurrection. But and he cites my article a couple times in there. So he you, gets. You know what it, I think? You know what I think is going to happen? Get it? I think. Well, I, I think the newer generation. Let's just say the the past ten, fifteen, twenty years of New Testament scholars. I, I think this is fair to say uh, have been forced to do more work in Second Temple material. Yeah. And and on the one hand that's great, but it only gets you halfway. So they run into the matrix of ideas, but but they they can't necessarily ask the question, okay, well where did where did the second temple Jews what what were they thinking? Why were they looking at this passage this way? I mean they can see that the New Testament is part of that whole mix, but it doesn't really it it just puts them in in, in touch with people living at the same time as the New Testament writers and, and everybody's sort of, uh, you know, dealing with, again, the same set of ideas and New yeah. Testament is often a, a little bit different because of Christology and Jesus and all that. But it, it, it doesn't take them back into, okay, why would they think of it this way? And so somebody like you, 
who has more of the Old Testament background under their belt, I think will be ac- actually able to contribute to solving that problem, or at least that might be too optimistic of a word. At least, yeah, I, I wouldn't use that word. At, at least contributing to okay, here's why go. they're looking at this this right. way. But a, a lot of it for for decades and decades, if you're going to be a New Testament scholar, what you did was you you know you learned your languages really well, and you did. New Testament, and then you did Greco-Roman stuff. Well, again, in the last few decades, and, and N.T. Wright has had a big, big role to play in this because of of his insistence, really, of uh, taking New Testament material in its Second Temple context. So that has really ra- ramped up the uh, the insistence in doctoral programs and in New Testament scholarship generally. Uh, to situate what we're thinking, not just in Greco-Roman stuff, but to go back to the Second Temple Jewish material. But again, they, they only go, they only make half the trip because that material is informed by, you know, lo and behold, the Old Testament. And the yeah. Old Testament is informed by its wider ancient Near Eastern context. So they get, they get halfway, but they're further than they were. Right. You know, they're, they're, they're tracking on the right trajectories. And so, I think your generation, you know, David, and and you know, as more of this this effort to to take an original context for uh, the material at each each sort of stage, you know, of of the transmission of ideas, the flow right. of ideas, uh, to to take the original context seriously at each stage. I think you'll, you know, you and, and others like you will play a role in taking it back one more step you know, to, yeah. to where it needs to go. And so that, that, that's my hope. I mean, that people who, who would bother to read unseen world, they, if they read the footnotes, they will notice that I'm, I'm talking about second temple stuff and ancient near Eastern stuff. And, and, and basically saying it all needs to get talked about, yeah. but that's, yeah. that's not the norm. Okay. That that's has right. not been the norm, but it it is starting to shift. Well, you know, just a word of encouragement on my end. I mean, I come from small biblical studies uh, college, Criswell College in Dallas, and you know we had a we had a great Septuagint seminar a few years ago with uh, Kevin Wurstler, um, uh, my thesis reader that you're on the committee with. Um, and in that class, we we talked a lot about, and I think some students are getting interested in seeing like, oh man, there's lots of interesting developments when you get to Septuagint and how to how Greeks are translating these ancient Hebrew ideas into the Hellenistic culture. And I think the trajectory thing is really important here that people are getting, that younger guys are getting interested in is like, well, man, maybe Septuagint's way more important than I thought it was. And maybe we need to look at how these Greek um, uh, scriptures are receiving the Old Testament and how they're translating it into language that makes sense in the Hellenistic world. Mm-hmm. And I, that's, we have to do that and see that this is all coming through those ancient Semitic trajectories into the Greek world and not try to do Greek world back mm-hmm. because it's more of a trying to, what we see in Septuagint and in Paul in particular is trying to communicate these hard, deep-seated and deep-rooted, no pun intended, um, deep-rooted uh, Old Testament tradition um, and Jewish tradition, and how do we express this in its Hellenistic world? It, it, it used to be, I can remember 30 years ago, when the, the first time I was contemplating, you know, I'm going to have to go through doctoral work here, but I remember picking up catalogs, and for New Testament programs, what you had to do were, were things like you had to be able to they they wanted to basically try to make you a sight reader. You had to have translated it at least once through the entire New Testament. Uh, you you had to you know take advanced Greek grammar. You had to be good at textual criticism. In other words, it was all New Testament focused. And the only thing you really did outside was you might get a little exposure to rabbinics, which is actually post New Testament. Right. Right. Okay. But you you didn't have any emphasis on. Second Temple, you know, Jewish material. And so, again, I think this is something that we can really thank N.T. Wright for because he's had such an impact and influence 
And and one of the reasons he did is is he's he's waving the flag out there saying, hey, there's this whole 400 years of material here that you're kind of skipping, you know, that preceded the New Testament that has that has right. ties back into the old. So why are we looking at just the New Testament and and rabbinic material, you know, the later material? It, you know, it, it's it's really quite a different orientation, and it's why it's one of the the reasons why there's been a shift in scholarship um, to to what. You know, as I would put it, I, th- I think that's what has to happen. Things have to be contextualized in what came before and, and what was going on during, during and before. And, and if you don't do that, you are going to miss connections. You're going to miss a lot of things. Yeah, I think our listeners have a, a front row seat to this change, uh, you know, through you, Mike and David. And it's it's interesting to watch as a layman this kind of shift in more knowledge is power. So why just it's logical. Why would you not? Mm-hmm. Learn more and go further back and get a bigger picture of what you're learning. Yeah, it's, it's like just why, common sense. I mean, why would right. you not do that? Why would you not want to have floating around in your head what was floating around in Paul's, okay, or Peter's or Jude's? You know, because we've talked about Enoch. I mean, they, they were very familiar with Enochian, you know, the Enochian corpus, the Enochian material. Why not read it? Because it's going to help you understand, oh, okay, okay, now I know why he's doing this over here and he's connecting this to that because I'm familiar with that material. All right, David, why, we appreciate that. I look forward to meeting you at SBL in San Antonio this year. And um, is there anything uh, you would like to mention as far as your blog or paper or how the listeners can get a hold of you, anything like that? Yeah, sure. Um, that th- you can contact me uh, via email at dburnett five one at yahoo dot com. That's d b u r n e t t five one at yahoo dot com. The the First Corinthians fifteen paper is not ready yet for publication. Um, after in November, once I get feedback um, from the scholars at the seminar, then it'll be publish worthy. You can also, I have a blog that I sometimes use. I have a current series going right now at just dburnett.com. So th- those are ways to get in touch with me um, if you'd like. And the copy of my uh, article from the last interview, if you're interested in it, just you can email me at that, in, uh, at that email. Okay, well, great. And I'll put a link to that email on the website as well. And David, we appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Hey, thanks a lot, Trey. And thanks, Mike. Yep. Thanks a lot, David. We're all right, Mike. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff. Absolutely. So tell me about the study guides. They're finally available. Yeah, and, and that is the right word, finally. Uh, for those who maybe missed it on the blog or don't follow the blog, you, you should follow the blog, drmsh.com, or follow me on Twitter, you know, at MS Heiser. Uh, the Study guide for Unseen Realm, as far as the, the, the Q&A companion. It's a companion book written by Doug, Doug Van Dorn, uh, set in question and answer format that tracks through the ideas uh, presented in Unseen Realm. That is finally available in print. Okay, so you can actually get a print copy of that. You can go on Amazon. You'll find it. Just put in Unseen Realm companion or just Unseen Realm and scroll down. Uh, through the the things that Amazon will return to you. So that's available in print, and so is the Leader's Guide for Small Groups for Supernatural. Again, Supernatural is the little version, the light version of Unseen Realm, and that uh, has had you know a, a digital you know Leader's Guide, but now that as well is finally available in print. So you can find them on Amazon. You could go up to, again, my website, drmsh.com, and search for them there, but Amazon's probably the quicker trip. Do you, do you know the difference of the two? I mean, could you speak on? Yeah, I mean, they they don't really look anything like each other. I mean, the the they deliberately designed the covers to correspond to the respective covers of the books. So, the companion for Unseen Realm will look a lot like the Unseen Realm cover. You know, the same colors, that sort of aqua greenish kind of thing, and then the other one is that red uh, color. But the the companion for Unseen Realm is like a catechism. It's questions with answers, and then the answers have footnotes and scripture references to them. Basically, it distills the content of Unseen Realm into sort of a you know pithy Q and A kind of format. And then uh, the Leader's Guide for Supernatural again that we, we imagine people would use in small groups, but but you know people could use it for self study too. That has just like summaries 
content summaries of uh, sections of the book. There, I think, I'm trying to remember how many chapters there are in Supernatural, the little one. I think it's 16, something like that. And I think the Leader's Guide has either six or eight chapters. So what, what each chapter is, is a summary of a few chapters in Supernatural. And then it has questions, you know, following that, that uh, people could use to facilitate small groups. So they don't, they don't really look, you know, internally or externally with the cover uh, like each other, but they, they are meant to correspond to the other books in different ways. All right. And then also you're giving, have a, a, a giveaway. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, there's still, uh, as of today anyway, there's still, um, I think it'll extend through the weekend. A one, uh, yeah, I think it will extend through the weekend, but I'm giving away a copy of the uh, translation of First Enoch, the book of Enoch that I recommend. And this this giveaway has been going for a while on the blog. Amazon lets you run them for seven days, and I think the seventh day will go through uh, the weekend. Uh, if not, you know, I, I'm, I'm planning to do other giveaways, but it's random. I don't determine who the winner is. Uh, you can get the link uh, on my website, drmsh.com. I also put it out on Twitter and I also put it on Facebook in the last uh, day or two. Again, just about the deadline for that. So take a look up, up there and uh, all you got to do is click through a link and follow my Amazon page, and then it'll tell you if you want or not. But I'm going to do more of these, so if you don't get in on this one, you know, follow those, follow the blog, follow me on Twitter, and you'll get uh, a heads up you know, about other giveaways to other books. Sweet. Good deal. And you've got some more details about your L.A. trip. Yeah. It, it, on April 23rd, I'm going to be in, wait, what is it called now? San Juan Capistrano. It's like I didn't even know there was such a place. Uh, yeah, San Juan Capistrano. It's about an hour from uh, Los Angeles proper. Uh, I think it's you know, still in Orange County. I'm not quite sure. But April 23rd, I'm going to be there uh, the whole day. It's an Unseen Realm event. So we'll have about four hours of talking about you know Unseen Realm topics. We'll probably have at least an hour and a half of Q&A and you know, if people want books signed, you know, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, so this, I think, is the ninth. This will be the ninth Unseen Realm event. But people can go up to drmsh.com slash events, and you will see a link to uh, to the event on April 23rd. So if you're in that area, you know, show up. I, I do have to I do have to say uh, that the, the the space that they're, you know, giving for this event is small. I've been told that only 50 people uh, can can fit in the room. So it, it's not a whole lot of seating, so you're going to need to get there uh, early. The doors will open at 8.30 in the morning. The The actual event will start at 9 and go till about 3. So in view of the, the, the space accommodations, you want to take that into consideration and be there at, at the beginning. So with that caveat, hope to see you there. Well, maybe we can pack it and – Maybe if we get big enough, we can move to the cafeteria or something. Yeah, right there, the gymnasium. yeah it's, in, well, it's in a Christian school there, so they probably have you know a, a bigger area. But uh, you know, well, I haven't been there, so I don't know for sure. But uh, just go up to drmsh.com slash events, and you, cl you click on the event, you'll get the address and, and all the details. All right, that sounds good. All right, Mike. Well, next week we're going to do our 11th Q&A, and then after that we'll do another Q&A. So we're going to double down on our questions and answers to try to chip away and make some headway with our questions. I've been getting a lot more questions here lately, so we really want to try to make a dent in all of our questions. So look forward to that next week. Mike, is there anything else you would like to add to the show? No, I think that's it. I think we're all done. All right. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you to David Burnett for the interview and thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 